It is most important to protect the eyes. Strong goggles with stout glass must be worn in all vacuum and pressure work when distilling or evacuating a new desiccator for the first time. It's from my old university textbook, Laboratory Methods of Organic Chemistry. The author is a German, Gatterman, Ludwig Gatterman. In 30 years in the field, I have consulted it hundreds of times. I have learned it almost by heart. I have never found it at fault. And no doubt, it has kept me well clear of trouble. Your copy of Gatterman was printed in Berlin in 1939 the year that Hitler started the Second World War. So even before Auschwitz, you had to face some dangers. You know, that is what a chemist needs. They say that Freemasons used to recognize each other by scratching each other's palms while shaking hands. I, I would propose that when they are introduced to each other, chemists should show the palm of the right hand toward the center where the tendon that flexes the middle finger crosses what palm readers call the lifeline. The majority of them have a small, highly specific scar whose origin I will explain. Today in laboratories, even the most complex apparatuses can be set up in a few minutes by using integrated glassware. It is a rapid and clean system, and assembling is as simple as playing with Lego. But until around 1940, integrated cones were unknown were extremely expensive in Italy. Plugs of cork were used for retention. When you had to slip a tube of glass into a pierced plug, the glass often broke, and the sharp, sharp stump plunged into your hand. It would have been simple to warn beginner chemists of this small, easily preventable danger, but in some obscure tribal recesses of our nature, survives an instinct that compels us to make sure that every initiation be painful <laughs> and leave its mark. This one in the palm of the working hand was our mark, the mark of the chemist, still to come, still to some extent alchemists, still somehow members of a secret sect. So on your right hand, you have the mark of the chemist on your left forehand, forearm you have the, uh, a number that is the mark of Auschwitz. My name was 1745-17. In Auschwitz, we have been baptized. We will carry the tattoo on our left arm until we die. Only by showing one's number could one get bread and soup. Several days passed and not a few shoves and punches before we became used to showing our number promptly enough not to disrupt the daily operation of food distribution. Weeks and months were needed to learn its sound in German. And for many days, while the habits of freedom still led me to look for the time on my absent wristwatch, my new name ironically appeared instead, a numbered tattoo in bluish characters under the skin. Today, how do you live with this number? Uh, my tattoo has become a part of my body. I don't take pride in it, but I am not ashamed of it either. I show it willingly to those who ask out of pure curiosity, readily and with anger to those who say they are incredulous. Often young people ask me why I don't have it erased, and this surprises me. Why should I? There are not many of us in the world to bear witness. You often talk about the hands, the sense of touch, and the other organs of the senses. Once you said that you had chosen, I quote, not to tell the story of the grand chemistry, the triumphant chemistry of colossal factories and dizzying output, but that you were more interested in the stories of solitary chemistry, unarmed and on foot at the measure of man. Yes, because this is the chemistry that has been mine. But it has also been the chemistry of the founders who did not work in teams but alone, surrounded by the indifference of their time, without profit, and who confronted matter without aids, with their brains and hands, reason and imagination. The hand is a, a noble organ, but school, all taken up with the brain, had neglected it. 
We should all know how to use our hands, our eyes, our nose. I'm very glad that I educated my nose. I'm able to identify by smell certain functional groups more quickly than the infrared spectrometer. <coughs> if This Is a Man concludes with a chapter entitled The Story of Ten Days, in which you describe how you endured from January 18th to January 27th, 1945, among the sick and dying patients in the camp's makeshift, makeshift infirmary after the Nazis fled. What's recounted there reads to me like a story of Robinson Crusoe in hell, with you, Primo Levi, as Robinson Crusoe. What struck me was how much thinking contributed to your survival. Yours doesn't seem to be a survival that was determined by either brute biological strength or incredible luck, but was rooted rather in your professional character, the man of precision, the controller of experiments who seeks the principle of order, conf uh, confronted with the evil inversion of everything he valued. Granted, you were a numbered part in, the, in an infernal machine, but a numbered part with a systematic mind. The scientist and the survivor are one. You hit the bullseye. In these memorable 10 days, I truly did feel like Robinson Crusoe with one important difference. Crusoe set to work for his individual survival, whereas I and my two French companions were consciously working for a just and human goal to save the lives of our sick comrades. If This Is a Man reads like the memoirs of a theoretician of moral biochemistry, who has himself been forced to undergo laboratory experimentation of the most sinister kind, the creature caught in the laboratory of the mad scientist, and then your chemical examination in Auschwitz. The door opens. Six candidates will be examined in the mornings. The seventh will not. I am the seventh. I have to return to work. In the afternoon, it is my turn. Alex looks at me blackly on the doorstep. He feels himself in some way responsible for my miserable appearance. He dislikes me because I am Italian, because I am Jewish, and because of all of us, I am the one furthest from his sergeant's ideal of virility. He shows a profound disbelief in my chances for the examination. We enter. There is only Dr. Panwitz. Alex, beret in hand, speaks to him in an undertone, an Italian, has only been here three months, already half kaput. He claims he's a chemist. I feel like Oedipus, Oedipus in front of the Sphinx. I am aware that the job at stake is important, yet I feel a mad desire to disappear, not to take the test. Panwitz is tall, thin, blonde, and sits formidably behind the writing table. I, halfling 1745-17, stand in his office, shiny, clean, and ordered. I feel I would leave a dirty stain on whatever I touch. When he finishes writing, he raises his eyes and looks at me. I have since thought about Dr. Panwitz many times and in many ways. I have asked myself how he really functioned as a man, how he filled his time outside of the polymerization and the Indo-Germanic conscience. Above all, when I was once more a free man, I wanted to meet him again, not from a spirit of revenge, but merely from a personal curiosity about the human soul. Because that look was not one between two men. If I had known how to fully explain the nature of that look, which came as if across the glass window of an aquarium between two beings who live in two different worlds, I would have also explained the essence of the insanity of the Third Reich. I am a specialist in chemistry. I am a specialist in inorganic <coughs> synthesis. I, I, I am a specialist. The interrogation began 
while in the corner, that third zoological specimen, Alex, yawned and chewed noisily. I took a degree in Turin in 1941, summa cum laude, and while I say it, I have the definite sensation of not being believed, of not even believing it myself. It is enough to look at my dirty hands covered with sores, my convict's trousers encrusted with mud, yet I am he, the Turin graduate. At this particular moment, it is impossible to doubt my identity faced with my reservoir of knowledge of organic chemistry. I recognize it, the fever of examinations, the spontaneous mobilization of all my logical faculties, which university friends envied me so. The examination is going well. As I gradually realize it, I seem to grow in stature. He is asking me now on the subject I wrote my th the degree thesis. I have to make a violent effort to bring up those memories so deeply buried away. It is as if I was trying to remember the events of a previous incarnation. He shows me Gatterman's book, and even this is absurd and impossible, that down here on the other side of the barbed wire, a Gatterman should exist, exactly the one I studied in Italy.